Good morning. Welcome to my lecture about the lichens of Brazil. I was invited by the organizers of the IEL to give a general lecture about Brazilian lichen flora. And I will not only give some pictures and uh, data about the current situation, but I will try to give an analysis of the flora as it exists. It's too bad you are not here. This is Bonito, and this is the place where the Congress was supposed to be. It's a beautiful place. It's uh, full of lichens. This is actually, these are two places you pass while going from the airport to Bonito. So there are high mountains, or well, mountains at least, cliffs with lichens. And there is, of course, the Pantanal somewhere in between. And even where I'm now in Campo Grande, there are lichens just along the road. I mean, the one picture is just a tree in a small street. It's full of different lichens. And another one is a roof of a house with usnias on the wood. Um, well, lichens are everywhere. That's what I always say. And they are also everywhere here. And as I said, I will try to present some new results, new analysis. Why flora? Well, uh, flora is an English word with several meanings, just like leg. A leg can be uh, all kinds of non homologous uh, extremities of, of insects, but also of other animals and of uh, chairs and tables and so on. So I don't think we should go for Esperanto-like uh, artificial things like funda, funda, whatever, or mycobiota, mycobiota, however you would pronounce that. But flora is, as I said, a word with several meanings. You can think of flora as a book, and you can think of flora as the abstraction of all the lichens or all the whatever other organisms in a certain place. Well, this lecture is about both. First, I show some history about four lichen floras of Brazil, then the state of the knowledge. Then I will compare some places, some well invest investigated places, to see what is the differences between them. And I end with the future. This was the first lichen flora of Brazil. It's really old, and it was made by and this is Marcius who did the collection. He, he made the whole Flora Brasiliensis. Um, note that he calls it Flora too. It's in Latin. But the lichens were done by Eschweiler. The interesting thing of this is, if you see the, the, the dotted line here is where Marcius and Speaks went. And that's really, they, they really went all over the north and northeast and of, uh, of Brazil. Unlike most of the other lichen collectors after them, most of these people went to much fewer places, much, much, they didn't travel all the way. The next one, next flora was by Vainio, or Vainio, that's the ways of uh, writing his name. And uh, he wrote in French, as you can see here. But the most of the descriptions are in uh, are in Latin. Um, he found as many new species, more or less, as species that were already uh, described, and he only treated the ones he actually saw. And I have some discussions, but he didn't try to rehash all the old things by then. Um, that is him, and this is the place. He did most of his work. It's uh, an area called Carrasa. It's, uh, he, he stayed actually in this uh, monastery and you can still stay in this monastery. And um, the area is still natural. 
it's not it's not, it hasn't been developed a bit since uh, more than 100 years ago and 25 years ago more or less uh, Fineo stayed there and there's walking tracks and there's uh, high mountains there's rock outcrops there's trees you see even the, the planted trees here in the garden are full of lichens already the third one the third flora as you can say is um, was made by Gustav Malme he's from Sweden he wrote mostly in German as you can see here and he 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 went there, he went to, to Brazil one time for collecting lichens. He went back another time for collecting other things, but one time he collected lichens. And more or less the rest of his life, he uh, worked on this material and he had some other people working like Redinger and Linde too. Malma went to the southern half of uh, uh, Brazil. So they, these are here's the dotted line is Malmö's uh, trajectory and the gray areas so there are three gray area four gray areas that's where he collected and he mainly collected his best place was the last in the top there he collected most species um also he described many new species and he treated he compared with the all the knowledge but um, so he treated a bit more species than, than Varnio, but it was far from complete. The fourth one is actually not this one, but it's this author, Alexander Zaalbrugner. Alexander Zaalbrugner apparently made a manuscript um, in, in, in the early 40s or the 30s, and in the end of the 30s. And he had a manuscript of all the lichens known and reported from Brazil. And uh, well, the thing is, nobody has ever seen this manuscript because it was lost during the war in Berlin. So the fourth book is still waiting to be made. And actually, that's the thing I'm working on at the moment with other people. So there's a current flora in preparation, and that will be the fourth flora. Multi-authored, mostly Brazilian iconologists in English, but some keys in Portuguese and keys to selected species per genus or sometimes all the known species. Difference with all the previous floras is that it will have color plates. The previous ones had no plates at all except for a few spore drawings. And separately, we will publish a checklist with synonyms and reference to state records so that you don't clutter up too much these things, which changes a lot. The plates will be mostly made by uh, Adriano Spielman, but they will contain pictures from lots of different people. This is an example, uh, Mirius Stigma. And you can already see a bit from the, from the author's names that all of this, I mean, 20 years ago, there was no Mirio stigma known from Brazil, and now there are five, and one of them is, one or two of them, two of them are actually, no, three of them actually are being described originally from Brazil, and are probably only still known from there. Plates look like this, so to the left, part of acantothesis, to the right, tripotelium. Um, Acantothesis is a group that is most common in the in the Amazon, and Tripitalium is a group that is most common in the southwest, actually. The checklist will, will look like this. This is the beginning of the checklist. You see, there are, there are many more acantothesis than will be um, illustrated, but I think most of them will actually be in the key. And if you if you look closely, a lot of them will still be have to be published this year to make the things complete. The current state of the knowledge. In the 19th century, only a few areas were sampled, but they were sampled rather exhaustively, I must say. So people like Malme and Fainio really collected many of the species present. In the 20th century, most of the work that was done was on macro lichens in the south. 
there was and and there was a there's a lot of novelties there and uh, that was the constant that was the thing people concentrated on and now in this century there was a real start with the micro like and services surveys and uh, a lot of brazil has been visited well a lot of different states but then if you go there of course you you'll be there a week or something like that and in the end you are only on some trails and a little bit off the trail so that the real amount of of area you see or the amount of trees you see is nothing compared to what exists but it yields a lot of things because in this in these last 10 years about 500 species have been added to the list of brazilian lichens including about 200 that were newly described from Brazil. After this, I will also say some characteristics of the Britain, of the Brazilian lichen flora and the prediction and a few words about the red list. Okay, this map shows, um, is supposed to show the, the distribution of Cladonia species in South America. So for all, all these squares, um, for each square, if it's dark green, it has one species known more or less. And if it's a uh, very red, it's 41. That's the absolute top here. Um, but actually what it shows best is not where Cladonias, it, it shows well where Cladonias are, are, are more diverse, where there are more species compared to the rest of the country. But it doesn't show where Cladonias are because everywhere I went, and I must say everywhere everybody went, I must say any, any lichenologist, you find Cladonias, usually just a few species. So it shows actually where collections were made. And this is the situation of the year 2000. And, and the author of the book, Achti, really did his best to examine a lot of specimens, many of which, many of these dots here represent specimens collected not by lichenologists, but by others who actually uh, collect, collect cladonias. A botanist is more likely to collect a big cladonia than anything else. So this really shows how much area was never sampled for lichens at all. And in many of the other places, when you look at States like Acre, like Amapá, like Ceará, there's not a single dot. These two maps, they're a bit different. Um, the, the gray shades mean uh, the, uh, the darker, the more species. Uh, to the left is heterodermia, but it's based on, on real a lot of data. So it's, it's kind of accurate. But the, it's in a way, it's, it's mostly in accordance it, it looks mostly like the um, the map I previously show in, in, in density. And the thing is that these macro lichens are really most common and most specious in the southeast. The, the map to the right shows the number, the total number of species per um, per state. And then you see that there are some almost white states, and that's just uh, an artifact. They shouldn't be white. Uh, something like Goyas, well, should have a color, maybe like Mato Grosso do Sul or something like that. This gives actually by state uh, the abbreviations, uh, the total number of species now known per state. And you see that something like Goyas with the Go and Piawi with P, Pi uh, are still very low. Roima, double R is also still very low. But the upper bar, upper bars give the current situation with over 4,000 species, and the lower bars give the situation in the year 2000. And you see that many of the individual bars are very different. And something like the first bar, for instance, Acre, there were less than 10 lichen species known from Acre until it was visited two years ago. And Roraima, the same. There were 20 lichens known or something like that. Amapa, less than five. Things picked up by other people and a few on leaves, for instance. So now we have a bit an idea which the major groups are. 
So there are the three main families, Parmeliacea, Graphigacea, and Tripeteliacea. These are the major lichen families in Brazil. And interestingly, Parmeliacea is, is a kind of worldwide family, it's species everywhere. But Graphidacea has, for instance, very few species in Europe. And Tripeteliacea has absolutely zero species in Europe. So people from there don't know this. But there, here there are 300, over 300 species. So that's a real characteristic, characteristic of the Brazilian lichen flora. The other families look more like, well, all of them are more or less everywhere in the world. But I noted that the hotspot, the absolute hotspot of Cladonia is actually in Brazil. It's not in Alaska or in Finland or where else you would have thought. Like in Genoa, and in red, the ones with roughly 50 of the 50% 50 of the world species. Well, looks a bit the same, eh? Parmatrima, Graphis, Astrotelium. So one of each family. And then on the other side, we have Cladonia with 100 species. Hypertachina or Hypertrachina, wherever you would pronounce that, is really specious here. Pirenula too. The geographical affinities. Yeah, that's a difficult thing because you to, to give a number for this, you have to evaluate the species. You have to see whether there, the, the reports from other areas are likely. You have to see whether there are synonyms, whether they are accepted at all. Well, so it's it's a bit rough, but roughly spoken, you can say 30% is endemic. Well, every time, well, endemic. And, and I know that about countries that I know only Australia, New Zealand, and Japan have more a higher percentage of endemics. Well, 30% is near tropical, that's what you expect. 30% is pantropical. This percentage is still high, but decreasing with recent research. And quite often with detailed research, people say, okay, well, in the end, the, the, the ones from Asia are a bit different from the ones from uh, South America. They are isolated long enough to call them species or whatever. There's also a small percentage of American and cosmopolitan species still. And I will say a little bit about it. Here are some American species, and some of them are very common or abundant, like this Ramelina usnea, which really is vegetation forming in some places. And some of these others, well, Cladonia dactylota, you usually find if you go to uh, uh, to a um, country in South America or in the new tropics, and apparently it grows also all the way up to the USA. Some are a bit surprising. Huh? Graphis inversa, for instance, only known from so far from the type from Florida, and now it's found here in central Brazil. Cosmopolitan. Yeah, there are still cosmopolitan species. I know that that is it's it's now quite common to say, yeah, all these cosmopolitan species are complexes and things, but no, not all of them are. And some are really just like this. And some have been, even with all the DNA work, have been shown to be just one species that apparently recently or continuously spreads all over the world. And here are a few examples. And some of them are to be expected. Others are a bit unexpected. I mean, Canlaria concolor, everybody knows that it grows everywhere. You could also have add here uh, Hyperficia adglutinata. I forgot that one. Well, heterodermia obscurata. I mean, grows in Scotland, grows anywhere, including Australia and everything. Caliciums. Many of these really calicium things are worldwide. God knows where. But unexpected is, for instance, Cladonia strepsilis. It's really all kind of worldwide. Uh, it's probably not in Australia, but or almost everywhere else. And it goes from uh, sea level to very high mountains. And even Caesleria signogonoides. It's not even known from Britain. But it's probably cosmopolitan, as it's oh, it's really an un, un apparent, and it grows on on the latter reed soils along the roads, and nobody goes there for like this. But if you happen to be in a hotel next to it and look at the at the ground, you sometimes find it. Here are a few world maps. They these have been published before, so I won't stop too much too long at this. But it shows that 
if you if you work on a on a monograph or something and you add up all the data you you end up with this that this small area in the northeastern brazil has 33 polymeridium species and that's more than double from any place else in the world even if you have a big chunk of australia that comes almost halfway um, very surprising and polymeridium is also something i mean every every lichenologist here knows polymeridium and, and identifies polymeridiums but people from europe have not even heard about it it's very different All the, also the, the the whole family of the tripetaliacea i mean the the diversity is really in uh, brazil and uh, especially in the amazon actually it doesn't show very well because the blocks are very big the the one record in europe is actually on an introduced plant so that's a that's a fake thing and you see that the zeros in africa are probably still mostly artifacts but they won't go up to 99 i can promise you that and even worse um even the, the areas huh, like this all this part of brazil we expect even more than 100 additional species per grid and this prediction was made uh, based on the evaluation of how well certain areas are known and sampled and and what is the the, the natural vegetation and uh, some natural vegetation types are more uh, yelled more uh, tripetaliacea than others a few words on the red list i mean if you know these things people say oh let's let's make a red list and you could say okay many species are only known from the type or one locality but with every field trip you find some at least endemics elsewhere a thousand kilometer away um there are no no specific specific groups with a high endemic rate so like for instance you could say the ramelinas are often very local huh? you have small islands very small islands like porto santo has three or four endemic ramelinas and saint helena has uh, is four and and locally common endemic ramelinas here we are not aware of any group that is specifically has a specifically high endemic rate the best candidates are actually species with a very, very special habitat requirements, and I'll show one, Trapeliopsus studere. It's recently described, but it has a very special um, habitat because it grows only in small streams. The start and the upper part of it on exposed granite rock, only at higher altitudes. It's a very distinct species. It's the only fruity ghost thing in the order. We could have put it in a separate genus because it's just outside Trapeliopsis, but we, well, we put it together, only known from uh, two localities in the mountains in one place. And a runner up, something for which you can say the same story more or less, is Spheroferopsis stereocaloides. Well, the name already is suggests that it's something very special. But uh, this is uh, well, not, but this is the place where it was found. It's called Pedra Tallada. Tallada means that it has these stripes. And everywhere on the top of where the stripes begin, it, uh, it grows usually. And on these places, but near, the, near the arrow, that, that's where one of the places where it was actually found. We are here on top of this rock. But not, well, a few months ago, in another place, actually in this, this area, Carassa, where Vineo collected extensively and where already three other major lichen excursions have been, we found this species 800 meter higher up in the same place and in the beginning of these waterfall uh, uh, things and 1350 kilometers southwest of the previous locality. This is more or less the distance Norway, Italy, to give an idea. I mean, it's, it's still the same country in Brazil, but in Europe, you are from the more or less the boreal to the Mediterranean. So it's not restricted to Alagoas. This is how it looks. It's, uh, this is from far away. This is, it's a field uh, picture, but uh, the, the black in between are um, 
lichens that grow underwater. This also is submerged uh, often. And then the, the here hypertokina to the north, to the to the left, uh, to the right, is uh, drier. So it's actually a bit too early for red listing, I would say. It is far too little work done. And if you make a red listing now, there's a good chance that it's be falsified. So in this, in this, these two cases, the distribution, the known distribution went from a few kilometers to hundreds of thousands of square kilometers. If you, if you just uh, say uh, from north to south, a thousand something, and uh, maybe 500 wide, who knows? And many of the species we're, we're talking about, many of the things that are only known from Brazil are either recently described, so others have not had chance to look for it in Paraguay, Uruguay, whatever, or they were described long ago and their identity is uncertain. And I must say, the above applies also to many other countries. Okay, next subject. Um, in order to find out what is actually the, the characteristics of the, the lichen floor, uh, we compared, and we is the, the analysis was done by uh, Rob Glücking, um, the, but the lists were made by me, and we compared the areas that we know more or less good species lists. And these were all visited in the past 10 years around a week of field work, various collectors, but always me present also, and most of the identification work done by me. That's important because it, it makes things much more comparison. One thing we, I did was go to all available uh, substrates and habitats. So not only trees or whatever. Well, this is a bit of a rough map, but this shows all the places that we visited, there are a bit more than 27, so some have been grouped together. Like for instance, the, the three north ones of the in Amapa, they are grouped together as one locality. And the, the ones in the in the west, the three next to each other in Roraima, also grouped together. But together they give a good idea of the local um, lichen floor. And the question was, for instance, are there, are they, are, is the, the characteristics of the lichen floor mostly bio, biome directed, biome influenced, or are there other factors? And these biomes, we have had already a lecture about this, and this is just a, a rough map, so I, I make it a bit vague, even uh, there's different maps, but it's the same scale as things like Arctic, Boreal, Alpine, uh, Atlantic, Mediterranean in Europe. Uh, it's about five to eight of these things. Note that 100% of Brazil is assigned to a biome, also towns, big towns, big cities, agricultural areas. And this means that a biome cannot be destroyed by this definition. Uh, so the biome is there, but of course it's natural climax forest can be destroyed. So that's, the biome is still there. And a biome, if, if I collect on a telephone pole, it's still in the same, in a certain biome. Well, here's the, the scatter diagram of the, of the, the, the plot, let's say, on the first two axes. And um, I hope you can see it well, but the, the dark green, for instance, is Amazon forest and the, 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 other colors and the combination of a color and a shape means a certain area. So Cerrado is there and it's orange uh, squares. And you see that there is, there is some, some sorting, shortage. Huh? It's, it's pretty, pretty okay. At least the, the Amazon is all to one side and the normal Atlantic rainforest is all above the, uh, above the first axis, so above the half. And the Catingas are below and, and things like that. And the Cerrado is below, but it's not totally sorted really. And if you look at it in, in this way, uh, the kind of cladogram, you see that it's, it's more or less sorted, but not, not very totally. So there is, there's more to it. And it's the, the biome in itself is not complete. Um, explanation is it doesn't resolve really all the differences between this 
well, what we did was also, yeah, you put in all these all these lists per place, but then you get also a list of species that are actually supposed to be uh, characteristic for a certain biome. And this are, these are the species that are that came out of the system as being of the calculation as being uh, characteristic for the Amazon. It's a long list. And the red ones are the ones that are more or less endemic indeed for the Amazon, or for at least at least for Brazil, but mostly for the Amazon. But note, for instance, that there's also this one called Catinga. So it was described from the Catinga, but it's more characteristic in our data set for the Amazon. And the other ones, the, the, the ones in black, I don't regard as very, very characteristic for the Amazon. This is this uh, Sulzbacheromyces, that's a Basidio lichen. It's actually quite common in the Amazon. And this, are, this is how the Amazon forest lichens look. And there's often these uh, dark things, uh, all, all crusts, white crusts, dark crusts, uh, something stalked. Katinga, a smaller list. Some, the two are really, I can imagine, and they're really described from Katinga and only found there. But the others, are not very convincing. And this is how the Katinga looks. Often big folios lichens, and then for the rest, uh, crusts. So there's the Parmili it's a really Parmeliasia area of Atlantic forest, north and central. It is already, we already split that in two because the Araucaria forest and so from the south is so different. Actually, only a few species turn up here and it's not not really convincing and this is how some of these areas look to the left these nice fertilizate uh cadonias restinga only three species fewer and fewer fluctua of course is uh, is only really rest, uh, growing in restinga it's a really coastal species so that's a good one but the other two, Mazosia, I wouldn't say so, and Fisma. Hmm. This is for the Araucaria forests. Actually, if you look through this, you still will see that half of these species also occur in uh, Europe or more or less worldwide. Things like uh, Ramelina of uh, Hypotogina livida, Imenelia seracea, Guelia sororia, Calicium hyperiloides. So it's Within Brazil, it's characteristic for the Araucaria forest, but, but it shows some other things than you would expect. And this is how, how this looks in Araucaria forest. Quite a lot of Cladonias and similar things. Cerrado only came up with two species. That's very little. I mean, there was a lot of Cerrado uh, data but uh, apparently the Cerrado data were not very homogeneous. This is how Cerrado looks often with a lot of crustose lichens, colorful crustose lichens, yellow, uh, the yellow tripetalias, yeah, things like that. There's a left, on the left side, there's a pink, pink orange, um, uh, Gravidacea. And the Pantanal, finally, has only one characteristic species, but that's a real one. Everywhere where you see this species, you know that you're in the Pantanal and more or less the other way around too. If you're in the Pantanal, you are bound to find this species. And it was just described last year. And before it was seen, but not realized as being new and characteristic. Actually, there's a one other characteristic of lichens in Pantanal, which I want to show you here. It's the lichen line. Here you can see the level to, of the water. Only above that, yeah, some, some part of the year there's water in the Pantanal, and only above that it is. Now we get here the, the, the question geography versus biomes. So the, the species characteristic for the biomes are not all that convincing. And the question was a bit um, maybe there's another characteristic. It's just just latitude and, and, and maybe altitude, but latitude and longitude. Complications are still 
that sometimes you have species from rock and others not, and other localities not. But I don't think they should be taken out because they are not present everywhere, because it's a characteristic of Amazon forests, for instance, that there are no rocks. You can look for them, but if you find some rocks, there's algae on it, and there's not even a lichen. Ah, this was supposed to show the, the which ones are from the northeast and from the southeast. But somehow something went wrong with this. So you cannot see. Well, I'm sorry. Actually, it, uh, it, would, it would have the main, uh, the, the main uh, conclusion here is that uh, all, the, all the localities from the northeast are together, all the localities from the southwest are together, all the localities from the southeast are together, and only from the northeast there are two somewhere else, and one, the most southern one, of it clusters with the southwest. And here you have a map from uh, from Brazil with with four quadrants. So the northeast, northwest, etc. Um, and these are, gives the the within the Tripitaliacea where the um, genera are most species or most present. And so <laughs> is dominant is most most variable here in in Capograngia and and surroundings and architripitalium is more for the southeast and polymeridium we show already is from the north east uh, but you also see here and just as a as a side thing some of these tripitaliacea actually have uh, form goals of, uh, and use goals on the bark. So there, and even the one here, even uh, two of the on the left, even uh, the bark is broken. So it's they're not so harmless. Not all lichens are totally harmless. And Tripitaliaceae show this very well. Here the Parmeliaceae, most of them, huh? also the family is most variable in the southeast. But for instance, Crespoa and this kind of Maculinas, they are most in the south in general, Neoprotopermelias, most in the north east, and Pseudopermelia is mostly in the west, Santopermelia mostly in the northwest. So it's very different. The, the left picture is a Pseudopermelia, and the right one is a um, Parmotrema of a certain group that only occurs in the Brazil. Grafidacea. The picture to the left gives Flaco grafa, which is a real Amazon like. And actually, the, the Gravidacea are by far most common and most species in the Amazon. But some of the groups you see have their, are, are mostly uh, or only present in some other areas. Well, these are some other groups Confilacea, Pilocarpacea, most common. In the Amazon, Lutritia, of course, Prusidia, but Lobariacea and a whole lot of more temperate elements are uh, special for the southeast. And to the, the picture to the right is a heterodermia of the Dactylisa group. It's a special group that is uh, quite common actually in, uh, in Brazil. Well, something like Maronora was already found in several places. Although it was only described, what is it, four years ago or so. Well, these are the Cladonias again. This is actually Caracia, the, the, not the, the so the, the one that looks like a Cladia is Caracia. It's an endemic genus for Brazil. And well, we would never have thought that it was such a special thing until DNA was done. And here there are some more Cladonias. And Cladonia in Brazil is, is, is really marvelous. It's not for nothing that, that it's the hotspot. And there's a place now, I'll show you, 
it, it, there's also still unexpected ones like this one, for instance. This species is uh, Cadonia lichexantonica. It's been described um, five years ago only. And it has like a tone. And there's already another species described, which is even more crustose, which only has like xanthone, also has like xanthone. And there are there are now several crustose, real crustose lichens, uh, Cladonia species, which have been overlooked a bit up to now. But they're they're everywhere. They're they're pretty common. And one of them is known from more than six days already. So if you look at this map, the red dot now. Yeah, the, that's the inlet, most inland red dot is Carassa, and there's not 41 species, but there's now 70 species now. So even in something like this, so if you go back to the best places, you even find more things. Um, well, what is still to do? In my estimation, about half of the species are probably still un undiscovered, including most of the local endemics. I can say that because if you're well, a rare species has uh, a little chance to be found so far. Collecting in new areas is always needed and like states with a handful of species, but also returning to, to known areas has been very useful because um, in a place that Malma visited, the, the Chapada, the Chimaraos, uh, we actually wanted to see and get a lot of uh, topo types, but what we got was 200 species that were not, not collected by Malma, or at least not reported, and not even known from the whole state. And Mato Grosso is one of the biggest states, and there are so many new Cladonia still everywhere. And Another example is, for instance, this Duca reserve. If you go, if you look at Amazon, um, a lot of, well, not a lot of places, a few places have been visited and there's a lot of forest still everywhere, but you cannot go there easily. And if you can, can go, you cannot easily collect. And I mean, so we went back a second time to this Duca reserve where, where you have easy access and it's very close to Manaus. And the second time we found 123 extra species in, in four days or so. And four of them new, 10 new to Brazil, 15 new to Amazonas. And there were already, and the first time we found uh, 170 species. So, I mean, what have we been doing? Still to do also is detailed study of species complexes. And Neoprotoparmelias, there was a time that, uh, that it was an easy thing. You had a suidiot one, an isidiot one, and a one with only apetitia. But now we have already 10 species, and I, I'm sure there are more to be seen. And they are, they are different with DNA, but they're also different morphologically. For instance, the number of spores differs. So some have 16, some have, what is the double of it, 32, and some have 64 spores, as well, hard differences. Lecanoras, many of the lecanoras seem to be new. Something that really needs to be done are the crustose white artoniasia. They are many, they're partly in undescribed genera. And there are already also that we have already collected about 100 um, undescribed gravidasia. And then there are still micro lichen groups like Cladonia, Heterodermia, Parmatrema, and Punctalia. And luckily, there are new people to do the work. So this is the same place where Vineo collected, but now there are other people doing the work. Thank you.